On this sunny hillside in Srebrenica, row upon row of gravestones commemorate those who died in the Balkan Wars, their names carved in stone. It is, of course, right to honor and remember the dead, but not to bury the facts of how and why they died. Future generations need to know the truth. This cemetery is not simply a peaceful resting place. It's a purpose-built monument to enshrine a false version of history, literally set in stone, a highly selective narrative. It preserves a body of lies that gives Srebrenica a special place in the demonization of the Serbs as genocidal killers. Allegedly, it was the site of the worst massacre since the Second World War. Up to 7,000 Muslim men murdered in cold blood and buried in mass graves. There's no evidence to support killing on this scale, but relentless propaganda has indelibly inscribed the name of Srebrenica in the iconography of evil. Endless comparisons with Hitler and the Nazis have condemned Serbs in the eyes of the world and made a pariah of an entire people. There are two things wrong with this imposed version of history. First, it's a fiction that ignores the facts. Secondly, the figures simply don't add up. The widely held impression that Bosnia's long war was one of uninterrupted, brutal and savage carnage is wrong. There were in fact only a few periods of intense fighting and casualties were on nothing like the scale claimed. Certainly atrocities occurred, but they were committed by all sides. There was no monopoly of evil. As General Philippe Morillon, the head of the UN Protection Force in Srebrenica, told the Hague Tribunal, this was a conflict in which there were no good guys and bad guys, just bad guys. By 1995, it had become clear that there would be no military conclusion. All sides were resigned to a diplomatic settlement. The Bosnian Serb army was known to be exhausted. As a result of harsh sanctions, it was short of ammunition, petrol and food. And yet, because Serbian areas were widely spread, the BSA had a front line extending 800 miles. This was the context in which General Mladic brought a force of two to 300 soldiers to the Muslim enclave of Srebrenica, a supposedly demilitarized UN safe area in Serbian territory. He was there to try to deter the 6,000-strong 28th Division of the Bosnian Muslim Army, which had been using Srebrenica as a base for launching murderous raids into outlying Serbian villages. Since the start of the war, three years earlier, they'd slaughtered up to 3,000 Serbs in cold blood. On the morning of the 11th of July, when he entered Srebrenica, General Mladic found thousands of Muslim refugees from other parts of Bosnia. They'd been forced to move there by the Muslim president, Alija Izetbegovic. They were badly treated, and over the years, many absconded, only to be immediately replaced by more refugees from elsewhere. Nasser Orich, the brutal commander of the 28th Division, along with some of his senior officers, was abruptly withdrawn from the safe area some six weeks before Srebrenica fell. The 28th could easily have defended the town against Mladic's small force, but they were ordered to abandon their positions and make for Muslim lines. Neither Mladic nor the UN had any idea that Srebrenica had suddenly been abandoned by its defenders. The prospect of Serbian revenge attacks spread confusion, chaos and panic among the leaderless Muslim troops who still remained. Some fled, some fought, some shot at each other. Clearly, the tiny Dutch UN protection force of just 80 was powerless with neither the weapons nor the mandate to resist. In the circumstances, a considerable loss of life was entirely predictable and virtually inevitable. It was clearly a calculated sacrifice by the Bosnian leadership. They saw it as a chance to further, if not achieve, both Muslim and American objectives. The greater the ultimate death toll and exposure of UN impotence, the stronger the argument for NATO intervention. UN Commander General Morillon later told a French parliamentary inquiry he believed Mladic had fallen into a trap deliberately set by Izid Begovic. Mladic then made his own way to Potichari to take charge of organization, liaising with UN officials, community representatives and the people massed there. By the evening, he was in lengthy meetings at the Fortuna Hotel to secure agreement and finalize arrangements. And yet, according to the judgment at his trial in The Hague, that same day, Mladic and close colleagues improvised a plan to carry out an unpremeditated genocide at Srebrenica. It begs the question, how was this possible? 
There simply wasn't time. Mladic was already deeply preoccupied with yet another problem, the threat that a 12,000-strong column of Muslims from Srebrenica would attack lightly defended Serbian towns like Zvornik that lay along their path back to Muslim lines. Nasser Oric, the murderous commander of Muslim forces in Srebrenica, was known to be bringing strong reinforcements from Tuzla to support the column.